Good morning, everyone. This is Laura Walker with Stratacom. Thank you for joining us for today's Advanced Practitioner Call. Our presenter today will be William Renfro, who's one of our senior consultants on staff here and a principal consultant with our Sharewell practice. Before we get things kicked off, I'd like to take a brief moment in case anyone has not heard of Stratacom to let you know who we are in a nutshell. We were focused in, or excuse me, we were founded in 1997 and we're focused on IT service management. It's always been what we do. We've specialized in a variety of big enterprise solutions out there in the market. And as of the last nine years, we've been a ShareWell partner. We've got a large consult practice of consultants on staff and are one of the larger ShareWell partners, offices around the country. Um, and our 16 Sherwell consultants are all certified. There are process consultants as well as technology consultants. So primarily we are consultancy, but as of late, we've started to develop solutions on Sherwell as well. We've got a solution around Kanban and mobile. You can see here a quick snapshot of the wide variety of services that we offer. If we can ever be assistance to you and your team, please reach out to us for anything and everything Sherwell related. Next slide, please. Here's a couple of snapshots and links to our mobile and our Kanban solutions that have been developed specifically for ShareWell. We can make this slide deck available to you after. Feel free to email me or reach out via the GoToMeeting app if you'd like to copy the slide deck. That'll give you uh, the links to mobile and Kanban. You can also find those at our website as well. So without further ado, I would like to pass it over to begin our practitioner call today. Um, as we get going, if you have questions, please enter those in the questions panel. If you don't see the panels, find the little orange square with a white arrow. If you click that, it should expand all your paint. You should find the questions panel there. Our presenter today will pause between slides. I'll use that time to ask questions that uh, you may have as we go along, and then we'll have open Q&A form at the end as well. With that, let's go ahead and get going. All right, so I'm William Renfro, or Will, or Bill, or whatever. Um, I've been working with Sharewell for oh, all years. Oh, about seven I years. I got – sorry? So I've worked with Sharewell for about seven years. I got certified on it in 2015 on version 5. You can see I've worked for a long time in ITSM, uh, 26 okay. years total, consulting for 20, the here, 23 please. of that. So Laura, are you asking me something? Or I, I was hearing background noise. So anyway, I've been doing this a long time. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about myself though. But, so let's get into the heart of why we're doing this. Uh, Bill, first of uh, all, I want to cover what this. Yet. What? Laura, I cannot hear you. I'm sorry. Okay, Laura has told me that she cannot hear me. I do not, know, do not know what the problem is, so I am going to hang up. Okay, my apologies for anyone who got left in the dust there. Um, something happened with the audio. Hopefully everybody can hear me now. So I'm going to continue going. If you cannot hear me, um, you, well, you won't be able to hear what I'm saying right now, so that's kind of dumb. But um, if there are issues, 
uh, let me know. Or let Laura okay. know, and we'll go from hey. there. Bill, can you hear me now? I can, yes. I can hear you, but there's a big echo. If anyone else is hearing uh, echo, will you raise your hand with the raise the hand button? Um, okay, it looks like audio is okay for everyone. So I'm going to restart. You go okay. ahead, Bill. Okay, so my apologies for the audio mess up there. So what does this webinar cover? We are not going to look at backend things like database indexing, health checks, and all of that stuff. One of my business partners, Eric Kruger, has a very good webinar we've done on that. We've done it a number of times, and he keeps improving it. Actually, last time he presented it at the Wisconsin User Group, I was taking notes because I learned stuff I didn't know. But we are going to go through some things with specifics, keys, form arrangements, relationships, and the rest of this list right here. And to start, we'll just go into this next slide. We get this question a lot. Why is ShareWell slow? I've been doing consulting for a long time, as I mentioned, and I've heard this question in a whole bunch of forums over the years, but it was, why is Remedy slow? Why is ServiceNow slow? Why is Tivoli Service Desk slow? Well, the truth is, they're not. But often, they're not optimized for your environment. All of those vendors, and including ShareWell, create this base application, bring it into customer environments, and then it's an ongoing series of tests and, and really working on the environment to see what works in each environment. So we're gonna go through some of the things that have been repeat offenders that we've seen in customer environments that have caused performance problems and things that you can tweak easily or things that you can plan ahead with. So let's start by talking about specifics. When people first get ShareWell, they think, this is really awesome. I can have a separate screen for each of my different call types or for some call types. And that is really powerful and it's really useful and one of the better selling points of ShareWell. And when people talk about performance, they always think about the number of rows of the table. They think, oh man, I've got 100,000 records or I've got a 200,000 journals record. But people fail to consider a lot of this time not only how long a table is, but how wide a table is, how many columns there are. So in specific, there is a limit of 1,024 fields that you can have. That seems like a lot, right? Like how could you ever run out? But we've had customers that did run out. And usually that's because they did not plan, they just started developing. So one thing you should know is that when you create specific fields, they are shared across all specifics. You aren't necessarily using them or adding them to each specific, but out of the box, specifics ship with around 300 um, fields, give or take. ShareWell has actually cut that down in more recent versions, which is good. So here's some things that we think you should do for performance, especially if you're just starting out in ShareWell. Plan your specifics. When you start looking at all of the specifics that you want to build are the ones that you're going to use. Consider fields that you use across all of them. Find out if they exist in the specifics to start with, like phone number exists right out of the box. But then look at things you can add and share and reuse, like effective date is used by a lot of our customers for requests like onboarding and offboarding, so you could reuse that. Start date, end date. And then we get into custom fields. And instead of adding a new field every time you use something, we recommend going in right in the beginning and creating like one, two, five of each field type. So you might have uh, logical one, two, three, uh, text one, two, three, et cetera. You can see down in the bottom in this screenshot, I've added two texts, two logicals, two numbers, and two date times. You can reuse these then in each specific and keep your table from getting wider. So if you look at the, the actual values and things you can change in a specific, for each view of the specific, you can change the display properties. You might have a number where you want it to be an integer um, displayed on one form and a decimal on another. You can do that and still share the same field. You just cannot make structural changes to that. So you can't change the data, data type, you can't change the length, you can't change whether or not it's stored in the database or not, but you can change other things. So 
You can change the name at the top and that'll become the label when you add the field to the form, but don't change the internal name if it's an existing field. If you're adding a new one, until you publish, you can change it. So specifics is something that really does require a lot of planning. The more that you plan for it, the less fields you'll use and the more efficient it'll be overall. Don't be afraid to use fields if you need them, however. It's just that if you plan ahead and you make those reusable fields, you will save yourself a lot of headache in the future. Um, as I said, we've had customers that have run out of these or come close to running out, and it's really easy to do. I have one customer right now who's reevaluating all of this because they're at right around 700, and they have plans to bring in a whole bunch of other uh, groups into their shareable system. And that could easily easily push them to hit that 1024 cap. So that is essentially the end of what I want to say about specifics, but just please keep in mind that the table being wide is not nearly as important as it being long, but it does affect performance long term. So now I'm going to move on a little bit. A lot of people don't really understand the strength and the depth of how much relationships play into performance in ShareWell. They really drive a lot of the functionality and they're really, really responsible for a lot of performance hits. So when you look at a relationship, those are what are used for the form arrangements, right? So if you look at this screenshot right here, you can see there's overview activity, journals, tasks, etc. Customer history, and this one has 3,959. That's because when I built this sample database, I purposely built one that would be slow. I took the 963 out of the box system. I created a one step that copies the current incident, and then I ran it against all incidents out of the box. There's like 105. And I repeated that till I had 213,000 some incidents. And then I created some other workflow that closed most of them. So in the system, there was like 17,000 open. So on purpose, I made it so there's a lot of those things because that comes to the next thing I'm going to talk about. First of all, when you open a record in ShareWell, the first tab always loads. In earlier versions of ShareWell, and I think I showed in this next slide, but we'll come back to that. Uh, like out of the box, this is 932. The first tab out of the box was service catalog templates, but a lot of people moved journals to be the first tab. It will load everything in that first tab when you when you open that up. Um, I'm going to back to the previous slide. 963 has mitigated this with a new form layout. So in 963, it doesn't load any records in that first tab when you bring up the incident because there's no actual data in there. So that is actually a performance improvement they've made in 963. I'm going on to the next slide for real now. So it's very common to see the customer's tab, uh, current incidents or the journals tab um, as the first ones, and those will load very slowly if you don't tweak them from out of the box. So as a general practice, anything with a single record is good to have for the first tab, like out of the box in 932, there's a service catalog templates. It only has to load one record in the form arrangement and it's pretty fast. Now, all of the other tabs down there are relationships. And as you can see, like back in this screenshot where there's a lot of them, out of the box, those relationships load everything. So to load this incident, it takes mm, a while. And I'm actually gonna go to my 963 environment here. almost clicked on the right thing. So this is a 963 that was purposely made to be a little bit painful. I'm just gonna search open incidents only. And I am searching against, in fact, it's so painful that now it's not responding. Um, just a second. This is on a VPN connection that's a little bit slow. So, Right now it's searching against 17,000 incidents and pulling them back. So I'm gonna double click on this incident. 
and you're going to see how long it takes to come up. And the reason this is taking a long time is because of those relationships. Not only is it bringing up the incident detail, which is a very easy SQL um, select because it has the ID of the record, but it's also bringing up all of the tabs in the background. And that has to do with relationship keys. And these are very important. I could let this spin for a while, but I can tell you from experience that it's gonna take somewhere in the range of 45 seconds. So let's move on to the next slide. So if you go in and look at relationship properties, you have a couple things that, are, that can greatly affect the speed. So you can see the load options. Load everything is not always necessary. It should be used for some things that directly support the incident and are gonna be one-to-one -one sort of uh, relation, uh, data points. So that would be like the customer, the subcategories, the SLAs, and the used active target time. If you use this for things like this relationship where instant links 30 days of customer instance, you would want that to be keys only. And by switching that from load everything to load keys only, the time drops exponentially. Um, I've seen it go from in one customer system, after you selected the subcategory, it would load the, the similar instance tab. That was taking 14 to 15 seconds when we changed it to load keys only, that tab then loaded in a quarter of a second, roughly, and it becomes much, much faster. So for any of those relationships displayed in the form arrangement, switch them to load keys only and test. However, there is a but. Like I just said, you have to test. Depending on what version you're on and how the indexing is set up, it is possible you run into an error like this. Um, you get this error if there's a key with a null value, uh, because I'm still working around it with a customer that's on 9.1, but the way to fix that is to change fields so that they don't allow a, a null, give them a default value, and then you can work with the DBA to write a script to fix the existing record. Um, if you are an existing customer and you have a lot of data out there, playing just for the load keys only on your form arrangement tabs, if somebody says it's slow, can greatly improve the user performance. And as a developer and consultant, you know, we say we design stuff and that's our first job. But really, I think our first job is to provide a good user experience. And anytime we can reduce the number of mouse clicks and improve, and improve speed is a win. So that is the heart of what I have to say about form arrangements and keys. Um, really do go look at all the tabs you have. And the system analyzer is your best friend when you're doing this. It will show you what query took a long time and what it was loading. If you don't know how to use the system analyzer, I would go find the ShareWell training videos or, or anything you can to learn because it is your best friend in the world for going through this stuff. All right, so this is uh, another thing that we've run into. Group maps are deprecated now in ShareWell. 9.6.3 and 9.7 do not use them anymore. They were really only used in one instance, and that was for tying subcategories to the specifics for displaying them. And group maps are slow. So if you would go select your category, Share will go look up in the group map which specific it was supposed to display. And then when it did that, you'd see a pause in there. It was a good idea at the time it was implemented. Don't use it anymore. If you're still using group maps, there's a ways to tie it directly to the subcategories. Uh, it's very easy to do. If you cannot figure it out, just email us, call us. We can point you to stuff that will give it to you. I'm not going to spend a a lot of time on the group maps, but I did, did want to touch on that, so. All right. Do you remember when I said that having a whole bunch of records load is a bad thing? Journals are the worst offender for this, easily. Out of the box, ShareWell is configured in a way that it records changes to a number of fields. It puts those changes 
into the journals as single record entries. This creates a ton of journal records, and consequently, you get poor performance at times. So what we actually recommend that people do is just combine them. And to do that, you need to go into the business object property. So here, this is the incident. You go to the history tab, and you can see there's, you specify which relationship to use. And then it says track field changes. You need to turn that off for this to work. But you do want to have it set to, uh, to combine changes and then turn off the all fields. You do not want to record changes to every field. There are certain key fields you will want information on. For example, owned by, you probably want to check the, the chain of who owned the ticket. So in case you're being audited or whatever, you have that information or use, or is it just useful to be able to look and say, hey, Tim had this last, I'll talk to him if I have questions. You need to go through every field in the business object and turn it off, except for the ones you really, really need. A lot of the time, this is an exercise in working with management. And if you're under regulatory uh, stipulations, like some of our customers have been, you have to find out exactly what they need to audit. But every field you can turn this off for is a win. And everyone you need to have on is just a business necessity. But out of the box, it is turned on, in my opinion, for far too many fields. And when you set it up like this, it will now create one record that has all the changes in it in the journal history. And it's much more efficient and it takes up a lot less space in the database, takes up a lot less time loading that tab on your form arrangement, and it takes up a lot of, uh, um, it's just an improvement overall. So. so it might seem like I'm going through topic kind of random, but I'm trying to get all the onesie, twosie ones done in the beginning and then really get to workflow performance because that's what I like a lot. So there's another issue that a lot of companies don't consider and that is data retention. I don't know why people keep old data. The funny thing is people who are under regulatory um, stipulations a lot of the time are the ones that don't keep data. They have a rigid data retention policy. For example, I worked with a large government organization where anything over three years, they wanted out of their system as soon as possible because they were subject to things like discovery if there was a lawsuit and it was just added more work to them. And if they had that, they published data retention policy, they were legally valid and, and, and good with the other thing people. So, so I would suggest to you to work with your management or whoever and define a data retention policy. Now this might not be a big deal if you're a small organization and you're doing a few thousand records a year, but if you're a large organization, you would wanna do this. Do you really need to see help desk tickets from three years ago? Maybe, probably not, or at least the closed ones probably not. And so in ShareWell, if you go into your relationships for all of the owns relationships, there's an option to delete children with parent. That would apply to tasks, journals, approvals, and so on. And then if you create a one step to just delete tickets that are older than X days or X years and schedule a one step on the scheduler to run at night, you can effectively get rid of not only the incidents, but all of their sub child records of so the journals, tasks, et cetera. And then you can work with the DBA or with shareable support if you're hosted to clean up the database on a routine basis. Um, so this slide should be at the end and I'm gonna get back for that. So apparently I didn't move that one. All right, so as I mentioned, we have repeat offenders of things we find that cause problems. In workflow, the set pending, which I apparently misspelled, even though I proofread this like five times, is one of the worst offenders out of the box. It is slow. I recently did a project for a pharmaceutical company, and I don't know if that customer's on the line, but if he is, he'll recognize this. But this is the one step that was customized in their environment, slightly customized from the out of the box one. This is version 9.1. It is better in 9.6.3, I'll get to that in a while. But I wanna show you a couple of things and things to avoid. And this is really where 
you can get big wins in ShareWell and really improve the user experience. So this was a 16 step, one step. It is completely linear. And it, I'm no, no, if you're not familiar with this, this set pending one step, it does two things. If the incident is not in pending, it puts it into pending. If it is already in pending, then it takes it out. It creates some journal histories saying when it started, checks a couple other things, emails the customer, pretty straightforward one step stuff. When we started working with this, I got the standard share will is slow uh, report. And I would not accept that from anyone. Um, you have to challenge people on that. Go to them and say, show me where it's slow. Show me what problems you're having. If it's when they click on a button or click on a link or something in the application and that's slow, very good chance that it is a workflow problem you can fix and make much better. If it's when it's loading a record, that's also probably a workflow problem. That's going to be the keys and relationships I talked about a little while ago. But for all of the one-step issues, this is uh, a pretty typical one and I can show you how it's improved. So as you can see, I've numbered each one of these and then I've put red boxes or green boxes or purple around them. So the red ones run if it is not already in pending. So the red ones run when it's going to be put into pending status. The green ones are the opposite. So they run when it's being removed from pending. If it doesn't have a box around it, it runs every time. Uh, the purple one runs if a variable named mail response is equal to lowercase yes. And the yellow one is a prompt to set that variable. So now I'm going to tell you all of the things that were wrong with this. First of all, here's some statistics that I've discovered by testing through these things. Every updated business object step you put in takes about 0.2 seconds. It doesn't matter as long as it runs. That's if the if the guard condition is is met. So that's without adding a save to it. If you're running an updated business object with a save, it takes far longer. Um, refreshes are also very very expensive in terms of performance. They can take two to five seconds or more. And this again goes back to the load keys relationships. I've seen a refresh take over a minute. So if we look at this one step, steps two, three, four, six, seven, eight, ten, and eleven all had saves on them. It's completely unnecessary in most instances. Step twelve, also unnecessary. It was a another refresh that um, was unneeded because there's one at the end. Uh, interestingly, step fifteen is actually out of order. It should have been before step 14. Step 14 and 16 have an action condition where the variable is equal to uppercase Y, lowercase e s. The variable was not even set to that. The variable was being set to lowercase y e s or lowercase n o. And since it was being set in a variable, it mattered. If you're using a field with full text search configured on it, it wouldn't have mattered. But in this case, steps 14 and 16 were never actually even running. Uh, I suspect that over the years, somebody actually accidentally dragged step 15 over without realizing it. Anybody who's been in the one-step editor for any length of time has probably done that themselves. I know I have more times than I can think about. Um, so that prompt was out of order. 14 and 16 couldn't have run correctly even if it was in order. And then there's an interesting point that steps five and nine create journal history entries or journal entries. And there's a quirk in Sharewell that was fixed in 932. Um, if you're in an instant, or I'm sorry, if you're in a one step, you're always in the context of a business object. So this one is incident. Those uh, steps had the set or make record current when it created the, uh, the journal entries that would break in an upgrade. Like I said, this was 9.1. When we upgraded a different customer 9.3.2 from a previous version, 
we had to go in and update a whole bunch of one steps where that was the make current record was uh, checked because a whole bunch of stuff broke because the context changed. All right, I'll move on a little bit. So here's what I did. I removed the saves, and this is the actual email I sent to that customer. I removed the saves on two of the uh, steps. I added a save after the first four steps because all of those had saves configured on them, but it didn't need it. They conditionally ran or didn't run, but this way, instead of having up to potentially two saves because it was set pending or set to not pending, I just had one. And then farther on, inside that one step, there was a couple even worse offenders. Both of these in the, in the, the bottom screenshot, both of those steps reloaded the record before starting the, uh, the update business object steps. There was no reason to do that that I could determine. Um, reload a record can happen at times. You would want to do it if you've gone out of the context of a, a record and gone and done like a big long one step. But if you just save the record, there's no reason to reload it. And there's certainly no reason to reload it twice. So I took the reloads off of those two steps. I removed um, the saves. I added another save at the very end. And then we took out that extra refresh as well. So here's the statistics on that. So just by updating those things in this relatively short one step, the, when we started, it took 22 seconds to do set pending and 23 seconds to remove pending. After we did that, I cut those times in, in half and actually slightly less than half. So it went down from 10 seconds to nine seconds. And that's when I went and started looking at the indexing. And then I got it down to under two seconds when we looked at the indexing. Now, again, I'm not covering indexing in this webinar. There's simply not enough time for it. But there is that separate webinar you can go look at on our website. Again, call us, email us if you ever have questions. Um, we're more than happy to just talk to people for five, 10 minutes and give them some insight or guidance or you know, talk through a situation. But we've now taken a very painful user experience where you're waiting 20 some seconds, which seems like an eternity if you're on a help desk on the phone with a customer. And I've been on a help desk on the phone with a customer. That was the first three years of my career. So I still remember those days well. And we've, we've taken it to a two second thing by making fairly minor changes. I didn't rewrite this one step by any means. I just changed the order in how it was processing things, removed unnecessary saves, and did a couple other things. So let's look at the 963 version of sent pending. I did it twice, apparently. So that should be set pending. So first of all, the thing we'll notice is it branches. There's that first decide between multiple cases is checking to see if it goes into pending or if it's coming out of pending. Then it does very similar steps to the one that I showed you. Um, it updates business objects, it checks a few things. Then it does a save at the end and a refresh. And it does that on both of these paths. Now that's good for more than two reasons. First of all, by having a single save and a refresh at the end, you're cutting down a whole bunch of your time. Secondly, by branching, and having that the case statement, you're now for, you're now eliminating the need for the system to even evaluate whether or not it should run a step. That might not seem like a big deal. I mean, that was just one, you know, there's probably less than 15, 20 individual things. And the evaluation when it checks the guard condition to see if it should run the step does not take very long. It's milliseconds. But I'm gonna go forward a couple slides real quick. It really matters when you get into complicated one steps. So if you look at this one, this is something I'm doing for a government agency where there's multiple approval paths and multiple things that need to happen depending on who's reviewing it. I could put this all in one giant linear one step. I can't even imagine how long it would take. I'm still tweaking this one for, for performance and it takes 10 seconds-ish on the longest path. So there's improvement to be made there. So let me now uh, 
we'll go back a slide. I guess I'm jumping around a little bit. So before here are our best practices. On, hey, Bill, before we continue yeah. on, could we break yeah. in with a question? Sure. Okay, look, it seemed like a good point to break in. So the question is, you mentioned a customer or two has hit the maximum for SQL database form fields. What solution was employed to rectify that situation? Uh, that gets very painful. The only thing you can do is go back and try to consolidate. And that means you're probably going to lose some specific data or you're going to have to write scripts to map things to other fields. Now it is doable. Um, it's certainly not any fun, but had you created reusable fields up front, or even if you've had it for a couple of years, you could start doing that. Um, most specifics development is done in the beginning of projects, but there are companies that are developing heavily and adding new groups all the time. And, and, and so if you are reusing them, please continue. But if, if you haven't, or you suspect you're going to run out, you really need to evaluate how you can start condensing fields or reusing fields or running uh, database scripts to move data from one field to another um, and employing the reusable field strategy. So you might, let's say you had 10 different versions of a date field. You had like effective date or start date or date of birth or anything. You could add a new field that was your generic date field and then create a SQL script, probably with the help of a DBA, to transfer all of the previous ones into that and redo it. But if you run out, like I said, it is painful. There is a lot of work you have to do to rectify it. So. Okay, we had another one pop up. I'm not sure if we should take it offline as a separate, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Um, someone on the call said they're trying to find their set pending one step to compare uh, and create a blueprint, selected incident edit form, but they can't see the one step lifted on the left for set to pending. Any tips or should we take well, this offline? Well, typically, let me grab one of these. So this is, um, 963. Yeah, I actually copied a 932 on it. Typically, if I can't find a one step, I go, I click on this one step actions. And of course, something blew up. I think my VPN connection dropped, which means none of those are going to work. But I would click on this one step actions and then go over in the search up here, type in the pending. And usually if my, let me try this other one just to see if it's working. If my one, if my VPN dropped, then it's not going to work. But actually, if my VPN dropped, I wouldn't be able to present because the presentation's in the cloud. So yeah, so I click on this and then just go search for pending and you should find it. Uh, it looks like out of the box is in the blueprint status folder, which means you will not be able to get to it from the blue client, you only from the admin tool. So, okay. Um, if you have any further questions on that, Rich, feel free to email me in and we'll we'll get you helped out with that. Um, one more popped up we might as well address before we move on. Um, this person said, I saw some tabs that had counts as the title. Does that affect performance significantly? Uh, the count itself shouldn't as long as it's indexed because that's just performing a SQL select count in the background as long as as long as that query is efficient and that's going to be tied to what you have for your filter on your tab right so if you're in incident and you go to the form arrangement this will take a second to come out okay so this is 932 so it's not 963 my 963 drop, but this would be the same in any of these. So if you go to the tab properties, so and, the, and when you have the tab contents here and then, I'm sorry, I did uh, filters. Um, whatever filters that you would have set in here, or any custom filters you have in here, um, those whatever query you set there is what's going to affect that number. So, if you have an efficient query, it should be fine. 
I actually get to something related to that in a couple of minutes. So I don't have a ton more stuff to go through, and that'll leave us a little bit of time for questions, but, but let me go through this best practices. So I talked about using case statements. If you're doing multiple things, you add case statements, that way the fewest number of steps possible are evaluated by the system, meaning it'll be the fastest. So if you have multiple paths, add a case statement for each. Also minimize your number of saves, add an executed command at the end of your one steps, and that will save you a lot of time. Um, I suspect the reason set pending became a problem over time is that people would go update it and add another step and update it and add another step. And like I said, uh, kudos to Sharewell for going back in 963 and reevaluating some of that code because they have branched it, they have made it much more efficient. But I know when you're going in and editing anything, just always be mindful of the fact that if you're adding steps, it's okay, but they will add time. And look and see if you can combine steps on existing workflow. So refresh, try, oops. Okay, so refresh is very expensive. Try to use it sparingly. Um, it only works for the desktop client and the web client, by the way. It does not work in the portal and it causes problems. So don't use it on workflow you're using in the portal. Verify your one-step order. That's just if something's acting right. Like with that one step I showed above, people were had accidentally dragged things out of order. Um, the reload business object, rarely needed and it causes a lot of pain. Um, after you've done all of those things, that's when you should look at the health check and indexing. Um, both sides are important, but I wanted to keep this focused on workflow. So let's move forward a little bit. I showed this long workflow. It absolutely matters in big things like this that you branch it and you be very careful with how you have it execute. I've seen much more complex workflows than this. There's a gentleman that presented at a local user group a while back that had one that was probably four times the size of this. It was enormous, but it was efficient as well. Okay, I didn't really know how long this was going to go. So I put some things at the end that I wasn't sure if we'd get to them or not. So let's talk about a problem in Sharewell that happens routinely to many people you'll get a request for a report or a dashboard or just the numbers from somebody. They wanna know how many issues are open today? How many things are closed today? Well, open isn't a status in Sharewell. Closed is a status, but really when people say closed, they usually mean resolved and closed. So if you look at the screenshot, this query called all open incidents is used for a whole bunch of searches a whole bunch of widgets, a whole bunch of dashboard stuff, metrics. And at the database level, it's running this or the, the four ors at the bottom. That's horrible performance wise. Um, but we all do it all the time because it's built in. And this is not isolated to Sharewell, by the way. I've seen it in a slew of other ITSM products. So here's a recommendation I have. Add a field to your major business objects and it has two possible values, open or closed. Now you could do a logical yes, no, however you wanna do it. I tested it both ways. There's really no performance difference. So add a field called open and closed, default that field to open, then add a calculated value on that field that it changes to closed if it's resolved, and it changes to closed if it's actually closed. Then add an index for that field in the shareable administrator, and then if you change all of your metrics or your searches to go off of this field, instead of going off of status equals new or status equals pending or status equals in cart, you will see a huge performance boost on those things. And it's even better because with things like metrics and dashboards, almost all of those are set to fire every five minutes out of the box. So they're all hitting the database at the same time. And, and it's a performance problem. And if you have, I don't know, a couple hundred help desk agents who all have that stuff open, then it can be a major problem. By doing this, you're changing the database to a very fast query and you're having a, a huge performance boost just because the refreshes aren't happening if, with a multiple or statement query. Because to back up, if you're not familiar with database statements, if you do an equals, like status equals new at the database, 
it's very fast. It's index for that. So you do status not equal to new and status not equal to pending, et cetera. Um, it, it's expensive. So making this one change and adding this one field that you don't even have to display anywhere is a huge boost. Um, and then I'm gonna go through one more thing and then we will take some questions. So there's also tweaks you can do in IIS to boost the performance. There's three things. So if you go to the start mode for each of the application pools and you change them to always running, this will boost speed a bit. And if you go into the advanced general process and you change the idle timeout action, this also boosts uh, performance in IIS. I, by the way, I do not claim to be an IIS expert. I've spent way more time in the Linux Apache world in a previous life, but um, I got this from another consultant we work with whose name is Kim, and she is one of the smartest people I know, so I trust her. And then the final one, and this really affects uh, the first user in every day who uses the portal, you will or the web client, you will see, like if you restart IIS and you connect to the portal, it's gonna spin for 20, 30 seconds as it loads everything. If you set this setting, the do app init after restart equal to true, then it reloads it automatically. So then you don't have that wait when the first person hits it. Or, so. And that is the end of what I have to say today about workflow performance. I hope you found some value in it and I thank you everyone for attending. So now tell me what questions you have. All right, right now we don't have any in the queue, so this is gonna serve as the 60 second warning. If you have questions, let's pop those in now. Um, so we do have some questions about will we get a copy of the presentation? Please shoot me an email. I believe, let's see, yes, my contact info is up. If you want a copy of the slide deck, um, shoot me an email. Everyone who's registered is going to get the recorded link. So it takes us a few days to process the video recording and get it uploaded onto our website, but you will get the video link. Just email me if you want the slide deck. Um, someone is asking um, if you could show the last slide again. Could you pop that up quick? Yep, that one. All right, so if you have questions on this particular slide, um, let us know. Otherwise, you can get a copy of the deck or take a screenshot. That works as well. And I'll try to correct there. the uh, sent pending typo. All right, so I see some questions rolling in, so thank you for that. Um, I'll start at the top and we'll work our way all the all the way down. If you do have to drop at the top of the hour, I as I mentioned, we're recording, so I'll be happy to send out the link to everyone here. So if you have to drop off and you miss the end of the Q&A, you can check it out later on the recording. Um, okay, first question we have queued up. Walk us through indexing. Do we have time to go through that? We do. Um, it is, it's a complex topic, right? So, but let's talk about the easy things to start with. I had said that you can um, add that open field to your to your business object. So we could do that real quick in this one. I can add it. So. I'm not going to go in and add the calculation right now, right? But when I get text 15, I'll just accept those changes. Now I'll go look at, oops, click home, or edit the business object. So if we go into the business object properties. We can, this is where you can see all of the indexes. And you can see sometimes databases have a field that's just one, like this index barcode. And then sometimes they include other things too, right? So this one is out of the box. It's not uh, optimized at all. But adding an index is very easy. We know we would want to add one on that 
field. So I can just add the open closed once I get to it. It's not a primary key, it's not clustered, it's not unique. And that's that's as easy as adding an index is. What's difficult is knowing when to add an index beyond this. So if you do something in the system and it takes forever, so let's go back to the list here. This is where your system analyzer is gonna be your best friend. So I'm gonna open this and I'm gonna load record. Yeah, that's, I crashed that, that's the wrong one. with the 932 client. And this is virtually identical between them. I don't think it's any different actually. So I'm gonna do search on an incident. I'm searching all, the, these are just out of the box sample records that come with this. So I'm gonna trash everything in the system analyzer. I'm gonna open this up. And it's more of an art, it's a science, but it's also an art form of how to analyze the results of this. So after this record loads, and it's painfully slow, and it was intended to be, um, you can see the indexer is, or the analyzer is open. You look for gaps, like here's a gap, what happened here? And then you do your best to figure out what those gaps are. So um, here's another gap of about two seconds. So these are validations that are firing. And you just have to go through these. But the best place to look for any of these, to, put, to know where you need to add indexes, is in the health check. So this can be very intimidating to people. So if you go to system maintenance, do not do this. Well, it doesn't really matter, but you probably shouldn't do this during business hours. Um, This is one of those things where I just, between the different uh, versions. So it's not actually in a database, it's under performance. You can do run health check. This will take a little while to run. Um, I don't even know that it'll finish while we're on the phone here, but I'm gonna, I'll am i go ahead and hit start. But one of the sections in this health check will show you suggested missing indexes. That is covered in the other webinar that's recorded on our website. You could easily fast forward through it till you get to that part. Eric goes into detail about that. And that's something that if you have additional questions, we can talk afterwards, but um, I, I will leave it at that. There's a lot of information in that other webinar and indexing is um, something that you should spend time on as a developer. So are there, are there more questions, Laura? Yeah, there's quite a few actually, um, and one of them, since we're on the topic, um, you mentioned the indexing webinar that Eric did. That's the one that we titled Performance Tuning, right? Yes. Okay, so a couple of people are trying to look for it and didn't find it. So if you go to our website, um, I think it's in our news or blog section, you should find it on performance tuning. Um, if you can't find it there, I can send you a direct link to it. Again, just... Um, grab my email address when we email and I can send the link to you directly when, find it when we send out the link to the recording of this we could also send a link to that because it's it's very relevant to this oh that's a good idea I'll do that so everyone on the uh, on this will get the recording from today as well as the previous performance tuning I'll send them together good idea yeah there there are two sides of the coin one you're tuning in the application one you're tuning in the well you're still in the application but you're on the database portion of tuning which in and of itself is a whole discipline. Okay, let's grab the next one and work through. We've got a, about eight or so here. How does reusing specifics fields impact reporting? That's a very good question. Um, it can make reporting a little more complicated because you have to remember the label you put with which field you um, used. I typically keep a spreadsheet that shows the specific actual field name and then the actual label I put on it for each form view. 
that comes in really handy for reporting because um, you don't always have the right label because in the context of reporting, you're not in a specific, right? It's specifically just a database record. And so it's going to have the internal name. Um, so there is some headache with that, but usually not a lot. Uh, especially if you keep a spreadsheet or some method of tracking the label and the field name. Okay, great. Um, the next one is how do we see where we are specifics wise per the number limit? So it kind of sucks, to be honest. The only way I've ever found to be consistent to do it um, is to go into the administrator tool. Actually, I'm going to save this health check in case we come back to it. Create a blueprint in the admin tool. Go to your specifics. And then you can add field from group. And literally the only way I've found to be consistent, I'm, I'm sure you could do it if you had database access to get enough field count. But I just literally just started here and gone one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, et cetera. It's painful, but that's the one way you can do it. Um, you could also if you got the list from the group leader, you could paste it into a spreadsheet or something. Um, there's a trick, I don't know if most people know this, but in a bunch of different screenshot applications, you can, like with OneNote, if I made a screenshot of this list and I pasted the image into OneNote, I can right click on it and do extract text and then drop it in a spreadsheet. You can see it that way too. So, um, next question. All right. How can we update IIS if hosted? If you're hosted, that's completely an issue you have to take up with Sharewell. Um, the hosting team has generally been good to work with, uh, but you have to be the squeaky wheel. I would, I would call them, and I would also talk to your account manager. I think that's one thing that is underutilized by a lot of customers. The account managers really try to make people happy. And they report to a number of different people, including the uh, what is the person's title, the like the success shareable success coordinator or something. Yeah, Laura, do you remember? Whole, yeah, they've got a whole customer success team. I think that ultimately reports up to or Carrie Cornella. But the person you probably want to look for is your customer success rep. They should have reached out to you. Um, if not, ask your sales rep. Um, but in addition to sales, there's that customer success advocate who's the person that really should be able to help you and get you the resources you need. Yeah, I would. You, you could start with the hosting team, but I'd also go through your account manager. Uh, if you don't know who your account manager is, find out because sometimes they change. And be the squeaky wheel and really, really ask them for their help. Uh, next question, is there a hit for calling a one-step from a one-step? Not necessarily. I don't know of any performance hit directly by doing that. The call itself is usually very fast. Um, all the other workflow rules apply, though, as far as the uh, the um, things we talked about, the saves, limiting saves and refreshes and all of that. So. Okay. We have two questions left to go through. So if you have any other uh, questions at this time, now is the time to enter them. I'll leave the lines open for about 30 seconds after our last question. But if you do have questions, put them in now. Uh, so we're ready for them uh, when we address the last few here. So the next question, is there any sort of way that you can archive items older than three years other than just doing an Excel export with all of the fields needed? It's not easy. We've the problem we've come across um, both in Sharewell and both in um, other tools as well in the past is it's usually really customer specific, right? So sorry about the pop-ups that keep going up. Um, we haven't come up with a good archive solution. I, I actually a couple months ago we got all of our 
consultants together or, or most experienced consultants to see if we could come up with a framework for customers at least for them to archive. And we couldn't come up with anything that we thought would even work for the majority of customers. Um, I understand why archiving is probably preferred to having uh, deleting the old data, but right now, I'm not saying it isn't, it, it's certainly possible to do, it's very possible, but it's so different for every customer, depending on how they've customized or changed the product that we can't give you a boilerplate application or, or even process to do it. It is something we're working on, we're mindful of, and we're trying to come up with a solution for, because it's been an issue with multiple customers of ours. Okay, is there one more question, I think? Yep, one more question. So this serves as our final call for any other questions you may have. We'll end the webinar after this. Okay, this person says, love the open field idea. Now I just have to find every query where I can uh, replace it. There's no easy way to do that, is there? Just hit the top queries on dashboards first and work down from there? Really, yeah. I mean, what I did when I was looking at it is you probably will get a lot of mileage out of, I gotta grab the other admin tools, right? Um, going into the managers, going to search manager, and just start here and do you search for open or closed almost every one of these is improved drastically with doing that open closed that field idea um where i would start with it is your uh default dashboard look at the metrics on the default dashboard they're the worst because they are always refreshing, then we we'll just work down from there. And you could probably work this in conjunction with the health check to see the most um, expensive queries, right? So if we look at that, I did change the, that health check, right? So where did I save the health check? Two. Here it is. So here's the health check. We talked about it a little bit. There's worst queries by CPU time and stuff, and they're over on the right side, which is being covered up by window mine. But um, so in your missing indexes, you would probably see the query show up in here um, because those get hit so hard. But with that open close thing, um, it's going to be widgets for sure, metrics especially and start with your open your dashboard then start looking at saved searches or queries that are embedded in common workflow like if you're um if you have a link that brings up you know like all open tickets or button or person's past tickets all of those things that are used by multiple people um it makes a huge difference for performance it's just unbelievable you'll go from many many seconds to you know a quarter of a second So. Okay, great. Uh, one right. final one popped up. Um, it, it mentioned you had a slide that you were going to go back to that was going to be moved to the end. Can you go back to that? Do you remember which one that was? Yes. So, so that was um, it was the lead into these IAS ones. Let me find it. So the issue, the IAS items that I listed at the end should have been prefaced by this slide. Thank you for reminding me. Um, this only works in Server Manager 2012 and IS 8. You can get it for the older versions, but it's a patch kind of thing you have to download. So that's just for those settings for the IIS. Okay, great. Well, I don't see any other questions, so that'll conclude our, conclude our webinar today. If you think of anything um, in the coming hours as you're reflecting back on the webinar, feel free to email us. We'd be happy to visit with you, as Bill said, at any time. Uh, we will have another advanced practitioner call coming up in February. Invites will go out in the next week, so we hope this was helpful and you will join us for the next one in February. Keep an eye out in the next, um, sometime early to mid next week for the links to this webinar, including the performance tune 
tuning and indexing webinar we did previously as well. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Yep, thank you, everyone.